Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Can you hear me okay now? It is good to see everyone here. Those of you here in the sanctuary, welcome. Members, guests, welcome to Hinsdale Philam Church. Those of you watching online, we would like to welcome you as well. Those of you who are here, if you're a first-time guest, we're so glad that you came. Join us for potluck. We have potluck every single week, so you won't want to miss out on that feast. We want you to flourish. Flourish spiritually, flourish physically especially. So come with us and join us for, for a meal. We're in a sermon series. This is week number three, and the sermon series is entitled Flourish, Exploring God's Vision for Humanity. I don't know about you, but I have been blessed personally as I have studied and prepared and gone to Scripture to ask the question, what is God up to and what is His purpose, His vision for humanity? One reason why we are in this series is to discover that God's vision is not for us to wither. God's vision is for us to flourish. Is that good news or what? God's vision is not for us to wither like a dying flower, but to flourish not only to survive, but to thrive. And let me share with you, friends, one opportunity uh, in our hospital network here. Next week, there's going to be next week, Saturday, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., there is a free health clinic. No copay. Uh, if you have friends and family, you want free health care, dental exam, foot exam, children, physical therapy, go invite a friend. You want it in Spanish? It's in Spanish too. We have flyers in the background. Free health clinic next week. We want to be part uh, of your journey in seeing you flourish physically. So come join and receive this uh, free health care from this free health clinic. In this sermon series two weeks ago, we learned that we are made in God's image. Therefore, we are valuable. Okay? Last week, we discovered the beauty of the Sabbath that from Friday night to Saturday night, God himself infuses himself into time. And he, he waits there and he says, Nestor, are you going to show up on the seventh day? We learned about the weekly pause button. This week... Our, the sermon, the teaching today is entitled, Your Work Matters. Last week, we discovered what the seventh day was about. Today, we're going to discover what we do on the rest of the days, on the six days before the seventh day. And so what we're going to do is answer three questions this morning. Question number one, what is work? Two, why does God give us work? And three, how do I work without becoming consumed by it or addicted to it? One, what is work? Two, what, why does he give us work? Why does God give us work? And number three, how can I work without becoming addicted and consumed by it? So question one, what is work? Let's go to Genesis. Okay, Genesis chapter one. We are in the first book of the Bible. We have most of the verses this morning in your bulletin. You're welcome to turn there if you brought your Bible or if you have a, a tablet or a smartphone. Go to your Bible app. We want you to see these scriptures for yourself. So we're in Genesis chapter 1, and what we're going to do is start with verse 26, and we're going to figure out what is work according to Genesis. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and we read this two weeks ago. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have, what word shows up in your, your Bible there? Let them have dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And one of the first characteristics of being made in God's image is that they have, a, they have what? Dominion. Ooh. Sounds like a very strong, forceful word. Dominion. I don't know why I just spoken that voice, dominion. And that's what I think about when I think of dominion, right? Dominion. What does dominion look like? Let's keep reading here. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So there is this complementary sexuality of male and female that God creates. And then look at verse 28. Look what the verse says. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And here's the D word, and have dominion. 
have dominion. What does that mean? To be made in the image of God means that I have dominion. What is that? The Hebrew word for dominion means to rule. It is sometimes associated with the word oppression. What does that mean? The word in Hebrew, which is rada for dominion, is used in many cases to describe human relationships, but there's one case in Ezekiel where this word is used very harshly, all right? So does it mean that we are made in God's image, we have dominion over the earth and dominion over the animals? Does that mean that we should treat them harshly? The normal usage of the word rada in the Hebrew is... Uh, it has a, a softer tone, okay? It has a softer tone. Let me give you some examples here. Uh, there's three verses in Leviticus, okay? It's Leviticus, the, it's the third book of the Bible, in chapter 25, where God is, you know, talking to his people about this, this rulership or this dominion, okay? Verse 43 of Leviticus, of Leviticus 25 says, you shall not rule, okay, that's that word rule, right? Uh, that is rada in the Hebrew. It's translated dominion in Genesis chapter 1. You shall not rule or have dominion over him ruthlessly, but shall fear your God. So God was asking his people to not ruthless, ruthlessly serve or rule over people. Verse 46, you may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a possession forever. You may make slaves of them, but over your brothers, the people of Israel, you shall not rule one over another ruthlessly. Hey, rule, have dominion, but don't do it ruthlessly. One more verse, 53. He shall treat him as a worker hired year by year. He shall not rule ruthlessly over him in your sight. So the word rule or dominion, to be made in God's image and to have dominion, doesn't mean that we're ruthless with our rulership. One, one writer by the name of Victor Hamilton says this. Thus, like image, exercising dominion reflects royal language. Man is created to rule, now notice this, but this rule is to be compassionate and not exploitative. Aha. Uh -huh. So to have dominion is to rule with compassion. To work then means to manage the creation with care. To rule or to work, all right, our work that we do, that, that we do with our hands, the, the products that we create, the services that we create, the ideas that we create or, or that we synthesize together, to work means to manage creation with care. All right. Let me look at, let's look at two words to unpack this idea uh, that we are called to manage with care. Just two more words, and I'm going to apply this, and, and you'll see how this, this, uh, this works out in our lives. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, look what God does. He continues the story, and in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So he makes, he makes uh, all the other creatures, but he places man in a special garden. Any gardeners here? Did anyone, anyone here like to garden? God made a garden, and he said, Adam, here's your home. Wow, cool. What do you want me to do? Well, check this out. Chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to do two things. To work it and to keep it. That's what it says in verse 15, Genesis 2, 15. And the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. That word uh, for work it means to, to till the ground. It means to work. It means to serve. And I like how Victor Hamilton says, so again, the note is sounded that man is placed in the garden as a servant. He is not there to be served, but to serve. There's the creation. There's the ground, Adam. The ground is not to serve you. You are to serve the ground. You are to serve the land. So dominion is not you serve me because I'm higher than you, but rather I serve you. All right? That's the first word, work it, right? Work, which is in the Hebrew avad. The next word, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. What does that mean? The word keep means to... To, uh, uh, to keep it, to watch over it, it means to protect, to protect the garden. So he's working the garden and he's protecting the garden. He's serving it and he's protecting it. 
We are called to watch over and to protect creation. I listened to a podcast recently of one leader in our community of faith who shared that in Africa, someone gave him a carving of two hands with, with an egg in the middle of those hands. And according to that African par- proverb, all right, that image, he's, the, it, it, it teaches that leadership is like this. Leadership is like holding an egg in your hands. We are called to lead, and we have dominion, we have rulership, and we have authority, but we are called to lead with gentleness. You, you know, you, 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 you squeeze that egg too much, <laughs> Breaks and falls apart right in your hands. All the egg yolk all over your hands. To have dominion then means that we serve and protect creation with gentleness and care. So what is work, friends? Work is managing creation with care. Say it with me. Work is managing creation with care. That's what work is. It's man- it is managing creation, the raw materials that are here in the world, whether they're material things or even ideas and concepts, it's managing them with care. Look, I know you might not have seen this before. We're called to manage creatures with care. In Genesis chapter 1, God blesses them. Verse 28, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Look at verse 29. God says to Adam and Eve, or God says to mankind, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall, not, you shall have them for food. So what was their first food? Their first food was plants, okay? But check out the next verse. Verse 30, And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. So the reason why God gave them this original diet, this vegetarian vegetable diet, is because he, want, he didn't want mankind to kill and destroy animals. You have dominion over the creation. You have dominion over the animals, Adam and Eve, but treat them with care. You can't ravish them and to destroy them. So we're called to manage cre- uh, creatures with care, We're called to manage the land with care. We have already said this. But notice what else we're called to manage. Now, friends, stay with me here, and you're going to see how this applies to our lives. Verse 27 of chapter 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. And what does the text say? Male, female. Male and female, he created them. Male and female. Male and female, for some reason, the God of the universe said, I'm going to make God, man and mankind in my image, and I'm going to make male and female. Friends, we're not only called to manage creatures with care, we're not only called to manage the land with care, we are called to manage people with care. And, and even, even the ones in our homes, even the ones we are most intimate with, Okay? And for some reason, he, he's speaking about male and female. He's speaking about, he's, speaking about that, he's speaking about that intimacy. Now, in any relationship, friends, whether it's marriage or parenting or your buddies at school or your coworkers or your boss, you're going to have disagreements, all right? Uh, anyone have any disagreements with someone in your circles in the last week or so? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> you're like, don't. Don't let me raise my hand because that person's right next to me. We are going to have disagreements. It would be like a husband saying, all right, family, we're going to go to Jollibee's. Do you know what Jollibee's is? All right. All right. I went, I went to my first Jollibee's, the first time in my life, last Thanksgiving in downtown Chicago. It was my first time in Jollibee's. Maybe my last, but it was my first time. It was good. It was good. It's just that I, you know, I, I want, I didn't have enough food. Like, I like when there's, there's more food. So the husband says, I want Jollibee's, right? But the, 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 the wife says, but no, I want Chipotle, right? I'm so, Pastor Ronnie always talks about Chipotle, and I want Chipotle. And so the husband says, no, we're going to Jollibee's. The wife says, no, we're going to Chipotle. 
No, Jollibee's, Chipotle. Parents, kids are like, we're so hungry, Dad, just bring us, bring us to the restaurant. Jollibee's or Chipotle. Jollibee's and Chipotle. And you know what happens in relationships? I want Jollibee's. No, I'm right. I want Chipotle. And if we're not careful with the disagreement, what happens? The disagreement escalates in marriage, in parenting, in your relationships with your, 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 your friends at school, with your coworkers. It escalates. And what we're doing is we're, find, we're fighting, friends. We're fighting over Jollibee's and Chipotle. In the grand scheme of things, we are fighting and arguing and, and, and bickering over Jollibee's and Chipotle. And friends, the reality is, the question I have for me and us is, what has been your Jollibee's this week? And what has been my Chipotle this week? What has been my right food? And what has been his or her right food? And, and I can't help but see that to have dominion means to manage creation with care. And in verse 27, a call to manage our relationships with care. We are called to manage our relationships with care. Is it easy? No. If you need help, Reach out, connect. We, need, we, we are called to manage our relationships with care. So number one, what is our work? Work is managing creation with care. Number two, why does God give us work? So let's go to chapter 1, verse 28. Notice here, why does God give us work? Verse 28, chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image, right, after our likeness, and let, uh, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Okay, verse 28 now. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Okay, there's another dominion, subdue, right? Subdue it. God, why would you make me into an image bearer in your image and ask me to, to have dominion and to subdue creation? You know the word subdue in the Hebrew? It means to subdue someone. It means to subjugate someone. It's to take someone and cause that someone to be subordinate to you. Subdue has a forceful tone. It's, it's kind of like an assertion of my will. The word for subdue in the Hebrew refers to subjecting someone to slavery, to physical abuse, and to, military subject, uh, to militarily subject a uh, population. Why would God use this word? Friends, I believe that the word, when God uses the word subdue in scripture, it cannot mean that we are called to subjugate, cause someone to be superior or subordinate to us or to dominate people. And you know why? Because we've already learned that we are called to serve and protect creation. And I can't subdue someone and conquer someone if I'm called to, to serve and protect creation, right? But here's the second reason. Verse 26 says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. How can I be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth if I'm all about dominating and subduing people? It doesn't work. So filling, so, so subdue cannot mean in this context that we're here to just, hey, everyone should be subordinate to me. All creation should be subordinate to me as a human being. So then what does subdue mean? So I like what... Um, there's one author by the name of Timothy Keller who wrote an awesome book called Every Good Endeavor. If you don't have it, get it. It's a really good book. And I'm, I'm thankful for this insight. And I'm going to share some insights that I've put together and, and put together with his work. But the idea of subduing, yes, it's a forceful word. It means to assert one's will. Question, how did God subdue the earth? If you go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Notice what the text says. In the beginning, what did God do? God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Did you catch that in verse 2? The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. God looks at the formless void material of this earth, and he asserts his will, and he says, let there be light, and there is light. Let there be birds in the air, and there, there are birds in the air. Let there be uh, sharks, 
and whales in the water, and there were sharks and whales in the water. So God looks at the formless world, and he asserts his will, will by, a, a, by forming things in the world. God takes the unshaped world, the blank canvas, so to say, and what does he do? He intentionally gives it shape. I, I just thought of, I just thought of, my kids playing with Play-Doh. Daddy, can I play with Play-Doh? You pull Play-Doh out, out of the, the container, it's, it's a, a shapeless blob of goo. But with some creativity and thinking, you turn it into a, a giraffe, Pastor Rodney, was that what they said? It was, you made a giraffe? Okay, a giraffe or a cat or whatever animal that you made. God takes the unshaped world and he, he, he asserts his will and he intentionally gives it shape. And friends, listen to this. I'm gonna quote Timothy Keller in Every Good Endeavor. We even see this love of diversity in God's creation of Eve. God could easily have created humanity in only one form, but instead, he created us in two genders, different and complementary, yet equal. The creation of Adam and Eve as gendered beings leads to biological procreation, another way in which we are as beings in his image, carrying on the work he began at the beginning. And then he continues, on the first three days, he creates realms, heaven, sky, and waters, and earth. And on the third three days, right, days four, five, and six, he fills each realm with inhabitants, sun, moon, and stars, birds, and fish, animals, and humans. Thus, the word subdue doesn't mean, hey, be subordinate to me. The word subdue indicates that God originally made the world to need work. In other words, God worked to shape the world, and he left the world unshaped for us to shape it. Okay, I just, just dropped this big sentence on you. Let me, let me repeat that again. God worked, okay, he worked to shape the world, and he left the world unshaped for us to shape it. He could have said, let there be billions of human beings. He started us off with Adam and Eve, Okay, so he shapes us, but then he leaves planet Earth unshaped for us to shape it. As an image bearer then, I am called to fill the Earth. We are called to shape the world in ways, okay, I'm going to write this word here. We are called to shape the world, right, in ways that actually, I'm going to put the word C-O-N-T-R, okay, that stands for contribute. As divine image makers, being made in the image of God, God has called us to contribute to human flourishing. That's what we're called to do. So the question is, why does God have us work? God gives us work to contribute to human flourishing. God has given you your work in your job, your occupation, you're a student, that's also work. You're raising children, that's work as well. God gives you and me work to contribute to human flourishing. Now, let me apply this especially to our community of faith. I know we have different audiences that watch and listen, but I want to especially speak to our community of faith and those within many social, Christian social circles. There is an idea out there that teaches our, our primary calling in life is to convert society and not contribute to society, okay? <laughs> so that's, that's the primary call of being an, a divine image maker or image, uh, image bearer, that I am called to convert society, but I'm not called to contribute to society. And so, you know, you, usually what's cited and what has been cited is like Matthew chapter 24, the signs of the second coming. Um, there's earthquakes. Have you, got, have, have you seen an earthquake recently, just a few weeks ago? Yes. Um, we see moral decay. We see floods and hurricanes. We see wars. Ukraine and Russia, they're still fighting. We see these signs. And what we say is, well, our main task as believers is not to enter society, but to escape. And so what we do is we should remove ourselves from society and we should get homes in the country because since we see the signs, the primary calling is to escape. And then what we should do is once we see the signs, we should only enter once in a while into society to teach them that they should have Jesus and then escape back into the country outside of society. 
okay? The greatest sign, friends, of Christ's second coming, can I read it for you? You know what the greatest sign of Christ's second coming is? In Matthew chapter 24, 24, verse 14, Jesus, it's in red. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. What's the point? The greatest sign of Christ's second coming is that people are not escaping to the country. The greatest sign is that is when the world is falling apart and bursting at the seams, believers are entering society, not escaping, they're entering society to share the gospel and to change society. The belief that we are only called to convert leads us to treat our jobs only as missionary locations. That the only reason I go, and that's, this is not on one hand, we are called to enter these spaces, okay, these workspaces, yes, to shine the light of Christ, right? Be the light of the world. But have I forgotten that I'm not only called to be the light of the world, but also be the salt of the earth? And how can I bring the flavor of salt? I'm getting thirsty now, right? How can I bring the flavor of salt if I have detached myself from society? It can't happen. So on the one hand, we are called to share our light, but on the other hand, we are also called to contribute and to connect with society. Mankind's first calling was to contribute. It was not to convert. Mankind's first calling was to contribute. It was only after the fall that God reveals himself and he changes hearts. And guess what? When Jesus comes back, we are not going, we're going to stop converting. In fact, I mean, even using that term, I'm not even, I, don't, I don't even have the capacity and the abilities to convert anyone. But converting others will stop once Jesus comes. And once that stops, what are we going to do? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to continue what we were meant to do in the first place, which is contribute. Contribute, contribute, contribute. So why does it matter that we understand our, our call to contribute? Let me share with you two reasons, okay? Two, pra- two reasons why it's important for us to understand that we are called to contribute. Number one, why does it matter? If we realize that we are called to contribute, we will realize that there's more to our jobs than to make money. We will be motivated to make a contribution to human flourishing. Friends, you don't just have a paycheck. And some of you are students, I've never had a paycheck. I don't make anything. Well, you're still working, and you will make a paycheck someday, okay? If you're a manufacturer at a car shop, you create parts in cars so people can drive safely, not just to get a paycheck. If you're a mechanic, you're, don't, you're, not, you're not just working to get a paycheck. You fix cars so people can drive safely on the road and reach the destinations. If you're a nurse, you're not just a nurse to, you're not a nurse just to make money. You are there to help alleviate pain for patients so they can get back on their feet. If you're any medical worker, you're a caregiver. You are there to support someone, to help someone get back on their feet. If you're a student, you're not there to make, well, if you're not there to make money in school. But you're there, you will earn money later on, but the paper that you're writing is actually to increase your capacity to think and to express yourself well, which will then help people in your circles understand you better and hopefully make the world a better place. If you're a surgeon, you're not just a surgeon to make money. You're a surgeon to perform surgeries to alleviate patients of their medical maladies. If you're a landscaper, you till and form the land or you construct you put wood together, two by fours together to make a strong foundation for a home. Oh, this, I'm talking about uh, carpenters, but landscapers, you till and form the land so customers can appreciate its beauty. If you work with your hands, if you're a carpenter, right, you construct, you make, you make designs so that you, people have safe homes. If you're a graphic designer, you create graphic designs that bring out the beauty of a product, an event, or a service. If you are a teacher, you teach students and you give students knowledge so that they can grow in their knowledge and become uh, citizens that will contribute to human flourishing. If you're a parent, there is a purpose for the diapers, friends. <laughs> All right? There is a purpose for the diapers. You change that diaper so that your child doesn't get a rash and can smile and not cry. All right? 
You're a boba barista. You work in a boba shop. You prepare and serve boba tea to satisfy customers who have a sweet tooth. If you're a software engineer, you design algorithms and code to ensure our smartphone apps and computer programs run smoothly. If you're a politician, you create and vote policies that allow society to flourish, hopefully. And we do need more believers in spaces like that. If you're a lawyer, you work with individuals and organizations to ensure that justice and fairness is upheld. If you are a manager, you manage your team so that there's cohesion and synergy in your team. If you're an entrepreneur, you're not just an entrepreneur to make money and to make big bucks. Rather, you create goods and services to provide the soil for humanity to thrive. And if you are a musician, any musicians in the house? If you are a musician, you create melodies and harmonies to soothe weary souls. And praise team, thank you for soothing, soothing my weary soul today. What's the point? To be an image bearer means that we don't just get a paycheck. To be an image bearer means that we are called to contribute. Here's the second reason why it's important to understand that we are called to contribute. Here's the second one. We will realize that all types of work that flourishes humanity, all types of work are dignified. You know, society today has a tendency, and maybe you have felt this, Society has a tendency to treat manual and physical labor as less dignified, all right? Those blue-collar workers, we're white-collar workers, right? So there's this, this economic uh, dissension. Here's my response. God's work in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 was manual labor. Yes, he had the, uh, the ideas in his mind, but it was manual labor. He created mankind with his hands. He shapes mankind out of dust and he plants a garden. One author says this, if God came into the world, what would he look, what would he be like? For the ancient Greeks, he might have been a philosopher king, right? A statesman, a political leader. The ancient Romans might have looked for a just and noble statesman. We need a statesman. But how does the God of the Hebrews come into the world? As a carpenter. He comes as a carpenter. And Keller continues in his book, the current economic era has given us fresh impulses and new ways to stigmatize work, such as farming and caring for children. Now you're a farmer, less dignified. You care for children, you're not, you're not in the workforce, uh, you know, less dignified. The current culture that we live in stigmatizes these kind of jobs. These jobs that are supposedly not knowledge jobs and therefore do not pay very well. If you look at society, we started off as an agricultural uh, culture, which then became industrial. And right now, it's, it's a knowledge economy, right? We think with our minds. I mean, my work is knowledge work. I, I think of ideas, and I craft ideas, and I share ideas. We live in a knowledge economy. Keller continues, but in Genesis, we see God as a gardener, and in the New Testament, we see him as a carpenter. No task is too small a vessel to hold the immense dignity of work given by God. Wow. And then he continues, simple physical labor is God's work no less than the formulation of theological truth. Think of the supposed menial work of house cleaning. Anyone enjoy cleaning the house? Yes. All right. I heard a one yes. <laughs> one yes. He says, consider, that if you, consider if you do not do it or hire someone else to do it, you will eventually get sick and die from the germs, viruses, and infections that will breed in your home. The material creation was made by God to be developed, to be cultivated and cared for in an endless number of ways through human labor. labor. But even the simplest of these ways is important. Without them all, human life cannot flourish. Friends, if it is true, okay, if it is true that all work is vital, not just sacred work, all work, then secular work is just as important as spiritual work. Can I share that again? If it is true that all work is vital, then secular work is just as important as spiritual work. So to do dignified work is to not only become a pastor and teacher and a medical worker, which, was, which is usually promoted within our community of faith. All right? To do dignified work is not only to become a pastor, teacher, and medical worker to convert society. To do dignified work is for anyone to use their time, talents, and treasure to contribute to society. 
And so, friends, those of you who, you, who you, you might not be in the pastoral field, the ministry field, in the health field, or in uh, the education field, that's okay. Because all, in, in God's eyes, before there was even pastoral work in ministry, there was contribution. That was it. Contribute, work, flourish society. An image bearer, friends, then, is not driven by cash. An image bearer is primarily driven by contribution. On one hand, there's nothing wrong with cash in the bank, nothing, good, nothing wrong with savings, nothing wrong with profit, nothing wrong with those things. On one hand, we need that, and we celebrate that, especially in high times, when we've gone through tough times. On the other hand, we realize that my calling is not cash. My primary calling as an image bearer of God is contribution. What difference can I make? What difference can I make? Question one, what is work? Work is managing creation with care. Number two, why does God give us work? God gives us work to contribute to human flourishing. Last question, how do I work without becoming consumed by it? How do I work without becoming consumed by it? Well, part of the answer was what we talked about last week, that we work six days and we rest on the seventh. And it helps us realize that life is more than production. But I've seen this. I've seen this in circles, some circles. I, even, I have seen, I've seen an obsession and addiction to work even with some circles and some communities that emigrate here from another country. We see it, okay? How can I work without becoming consumed by it? Well, Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 says this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You see, Adam was called to work. He was called to work that garden. Keep it, save it, protect it. But he was asked, he said, Adam, I put two trees. Don't eat from the wrong tree. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve did not trust God, and they ate fruit from the wrong tree, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Their distrust and their disobedience brought sin, shame, and darkness into this world. We're going to learn more about this sin and shame problem next week. But because of their distrust and their disobedience, they brought sin and shame and darkness into this world. Now, the good work that they created was tainted and was cursed. In fact, Genesis chapter 3 says this. God says to Adam, and, and, and to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. And he says in verse 19, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. What's going on, Adam? Adam is going to turn to dust. Darkness stained his work. Darkness stained Adam and Eve's work. And you know, not only was Adam and Eve cursed, the serpent was cursed too. Because the scripture says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, the Lord said to the serpent, Hey serpent, listen up. I've seen you before. I know what you're up to. I saw what you did. Listen up, serpent. Verse 14, because you have done this to my Adam and Eve, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And please listen, serpent, please listen. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Adam and Eve sinned. They were cursed. They were going to receive death. The serpent was cursed. He was going to receive death. But did you know, as many scholars say, that this was the first promise of Jesus of the Messiah in all of Scripture. Because in Genesis chapter 3, he says to the serpent, serpent, I will put enmity, this, this relational hatred between you and the woman, Eve, and your offspring, the followers of the enemy, and also the followers of the woman or the church. And then he says, okay, then he says, 
I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. What did Jesus do on the cross of Calvary? He bruised the head of the serpent, said, don't you mess with the human beings. Don't you mess with my Adams and Eves in the world. I'm going to pay the penalty. But you know who received the worst curse of them all between Adam and Eve and the serpent? The text says, he shall bruise your head. He says, he. But you shall bruise his heel. Who is that he? Who is that he? The worst curse was laid on the creator. You see, Christ was there when he created Adam and Eve. They sinned and they left God. That same creator a few thousand years later, he became, he came in the world and he served as a carpenter. And a few years later, even before he hit 40 years old, what happened? That carpenter Jesus went to Calvary to be crucified. He was fulfilling the promise that God made to the serpent. One day, serpent, Jesus is going to bruise your head, but you're going to bruise his heel. The worst curse, friends, didn't fall on Adam and Eve. The worst curse didn't fall on Satan. The worst curse fell on Jesus, the promised one. And why is that? Because the scripture says that when Jesus was on the cross, he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? He who never tasted sin, he never sinned in his life, became sin for us, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him, which is to say that Jesus took the curse, the penalty that we deserve so that we could live in a perfect garden with him forever. It is because Jesus, the creator, became a carpenter and went to the cross for me that I can have the joy and the assurance that I can live with him forever. His work and achievements surpass, infinitely surpass my work and achievements. I get really excited when I craft a sermon or when you, you administer a, a medicine or when you, you make a, a bench out of plywood or out of two by fours. We get excited about our work. My work and achievements pale in comparison to the work and achievements of Jesus on Calvary. And so the last question is, how do I work without being consumed by it? The way I do so is I work, but in the background, I'm consumed by Christ's work. That's how I can work without, without it becoming an idol. When I believe and trust Christ's finished work for me, I can never boast about my work and achievements. And at the same time, I have the assurance that he who began a work in and through me will be faithful to complete that promise. If Jesus has called me, said, Nestor, I'm going to turn your life around. Open your heart to me. Let me in. And as I behold the, the amazing, awesome work of my Savior, how can I boast about the work that I do and the, the growth of a church or the, the adulation I get when say, Pastor, I really appreciate your sermon. How can I boast when my work pales in comparison to the great work of Christ for me? What he begins in my life, he will complete it. And Jesus, my friends, will complete his work in me and through me. He will complete his work in you and through you. Friends, the only way that we can work without worshiping work is by worshiping the one whose work really matters in the universe. And that's the work of Jesus Christ. That's why our praise team is going to come up and we're going to sing this song. I love this song. It's a modern hymn written by a group called City of Light. And it's entitled, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. Let me read the verse and chorus, and then we're going to sing together. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. And then, he, they, then the writers say, To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I but through Christ in me. 
Let's stand together. We're going to sing this song. And if you've been touched and you're saying, hey, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus, let us know with the connect card in front of you. Fill it out right. I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. Or scan that QR code. Go to that website. Let us know. You can drop the, the connect card off in the offering plate on your way out. Let us know. We want to come alongside you in your, 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 your journey with Jesus. Let's sing to our Savior who has given all for us.